Uh, good afternoon and welcome to our October Tuesday topics sponsored by the League of Women Voters of Topeka Shawnee County. I was thinking today I need to ask somebody with more history. We've been doing Tuesday topics for a long time and uh, uh, hopefully it is a service to our community. We're looking forward to, uh, we've been saved by Zoom. We're looking forward to going back to the library and, and seeing Lisa in person in January. So, and all of us, so it's good. Uh, I wanted to quickly, in case everybody didn't know, uh, update on the lawsuit. They have appealed the judge's decision that didn't uh, do an injunction against the uh, the part of the law that's keeping us from doing some of our no usual uh, voter registration activities. So that's going directly to the Kansas Supreme Court. So I hope that we will hear something positive uh, about that. Nevertheless, uh, we're active and we're working hard. <clears throat> about a week ago, we sponsored a candidate forum that I think was a big success. We started working on it with uh, League of Women Voters and the advocacy uh, group from YWCA. Before it was over, we had 20 community groups that believe in the importance of voting to the health of a community co-sponsoring us. And we had 11 of the 13 candidates on. I think at least 130 persons attended. That may have been one of the largest um, um, gatherings we've ever sponsored. So happy about that. And uh, he's not on here, but I give him a compliment even behind his back. Angel Romero from the United Way was our moderator and he did a great job. Um, don't forget today's a day for our fun fundraiser, um, books, bags, and jewelry and beyond uh, at Judy Muller's house. So that's from four to seven. And I, I just sent somebody off with some purses that I had forgotten to take over. So, so take, take part in that if you can, it, it's fun. Do we have any announcements from anybody else? Then without further ado, I think I will go ahead and announce our speakers and let them get started telling us about the Stepping Up Initiative. And when we're talking about uh, collaboration among groups, making your efforts more powerful, I think the Stepping Up Initiative is another example of collaboration that strengthens efforts in a community. And uh, I'm not gonna say much about it because they know everything about it. Um, we have two speakers. Um, the first one we've already talked to a little bit. I, I don't think he ever met a stranger and a lot of people know him, uh, but Bill Persinger is the, uh, the head of Vallejo Mental Health here in Topeka. Um, five generations in Osage County, um, although he was born on Bermuda and he even tells the year, um, but I won't, he can. Um, and Lincoln then, was president. <laughs> <laughs> Lincoln. <laughs> That was right after I was born. There you go. <laughs> so, he's a bluegrass fan, enjoys camping and hiking, and, and really well known around the community. Uh, I will go ahead and announce your partner, Bill, um, uh, Brian Cole, who's with the Shawnee County Deputy, uh, Department of Corrections. And um, Brian graduated from Washburn with a criminal justice and a psychology degree. He has moved up into the Department of Corrections uh, because he, I think he has a passion for corrections. So he's the first director of corrections with the Shawnee County Department of Corrections who started his career as a corrections specialist. So I just help me welcome them. I'm looking forward to hearing from you. Thank you, it's an honor. How about uh, Brian, how about we let age take rank here and I'll just take a couple of minutes Awesome. Uh, you know, I'll tell you what, <clears throat> we're here to talk about Stepping Up, which is an initiative all over the country, really, and with Shawnee County, thanks to our county commissioners and, and really a lot of support from the city as well, uh, are, are way ahead of the game in trying to keep mentally ill people, people who have a mental illness out of jail, or if they're in jail, to safely get them out of jail and into treatment. And uh, we just, uh, we'll, we'll hear a little bit more about that today. But I will tell you what, 
many of the advances that and and the status we enjoy here in Shawnee County is due to Dennis Bosley. Uh, Dennis uh, was uh, the forerunner um, and uh, the father. I was going to say grandfather Dennis, but <laughs> the father of uh, you know crisis intervention training here, along with some others in the county. Uh, chief, uh, former police chief uh, Cochran, and and uh, some others. And um, I just want to give a shout out to to Dennis. Uh, he and I go way back. He served on the mental health board. Um, in the mental health area next to mine out in Western Kansas when I started my career in 78 in mental health centers in Greensburg. But Dennis was out there at that time volunteering and advocating and, and hasn't let up a bit since. And I can go around the screen here, Lisa Staley at the library is a great conversation promoter. And, you know, I could just go around the screen, spend 20 minutes saying thanks to people. But one of the most valuable partnerships I enjoy here in the county is Brian Cole our corrections director, and uh, together we're going to tag team uh, information about stepping up uh, the um, <clears throat> and, and uh, a model we use to identify uh, gaps in services here in the county. Uh, Brian? Well, thank you. Thank you, Bill. And, and, and I want to echo the same thing about everybody here. Uh, the reason we do good stuff at the jail is because of you all, uh, you know, being the largest, you know, agency in the county, uh, it, it, it demands relationships. And, and in my life, everything's about relationships. So I want to say thank you for kicking me in the butt when it, I need to be on a board or come speak, because um, that's what it's all about, is being able to uh, be out and, and, and get involved in the community. And I want our community to be involved. But I, I, I want to go back to, you know, Bill echoing the stuff about Dennis, you know, back in 2007, 2008, I believe, uh, you know, when it came up about CIT and they came to me and said, you know, Brian, we need to talk about CIT. And I said, you know, OK, what's the jail need to be involved for? This is about making stuff safe on the streets. It's about diverting people away from jail and stuff. But, you know, but when it took me about 10 minutes after talking to Dennis, it was I learned very quickly that, you know, we have crisis intervention inside the jail and this impacts everything in the community, impacts everything in jail. So. Uh, so that was I was sold after that and, and been involved. Uh, Bill has been a tremendous colleague, mentor of mine to help me through and understand a lot more than uh, of getting to know stuff that I didn't know about the, the mental health and behavioral health care uh, genre and stuff like that. So, you know, being here 32 years, uh, uh, you know, serving those who suffer with uh, mental illness and behavioral health care is, is a huge challenge for us and uh, uh, I have enjoyed every bit of it uh, uh, and, and want to continue to do whatever we can to get the services. Um, you know, I think the one thing that's the most fitting to me is, is that the biggest challenge with dealing with those in behavioral health care is somebody comes in with a heart problem, diabetic or whatever, a doctor can say we can do it. When it's mental health or behavioral health, it's, it, it's just seen differently. And I want to be able to, break the stigma of those who have mental illness to be able to uh, see it as the same level that if somebody has a problem with their heart, we treat it the same way as somebody has a problem with their mind or their health or something like that. So I look forward to happy to answer any questions. I'm going to let Bill take a uh, fill in where uh, he needs me to uh, and so like that. But everybody on the screen, thank you so much. Uh, I, I owe a great deal to every one of you. Um, uh, I, I pray for you and I truly am blessed to be able to be here today. You know, there's a, I might just cover a few basic topics before we get into the, a few of the specifics about stepping up, stepping up the national effort really brings everything together that, that Brian and I will try to cover for you. And uh, Madam, Madam Chair, how much time do we have today? Uh, we have until one o'clock. So okay. plenty um, of time. I'll go to 1258 and I'll turn it over to Brian. <laughs> <laughs> um, real quickly, though, you know, um, Brian's exactly right. Uh, we've tried to, you know, bring uh, mental health and addictions treatment from an art uh, to a science, but also uh, to make quite a bit, at least what we do here at Vallejo, about public safety. And so our natural partners are the city and the county, the, the police forces, the jail. 
uh, first responders, so people like that. And, you know, right along with those folks, the mental health staff and the, the addiction staff are on duty t- literally 24 hours a day in person. But we couldn't do that without our partners. You know, the, st- the city of Topeka steps up and, and funds our, our, our alcohol and drug detox program, which we wouldn't have. It wasn't for people like Spencer and others. And, and the county uh, steps up and, and funds uh, mental health care and addictions care for people who uh, don't have money and uh, just takes a lots and lots of partners. But the, the big words to focus on is CIT, Crisis Intervention Training. And because of leadership at the city and county level, most of our law enforcement personnel uh, officers in the city and the county are trained in crisis intervention training. It's a national, international model uh, and that gives law enforcement officers who often work side by side with mental health staff on the street, and we do that here in Topeka and Shawnee County, extra tools on how to engage people who are having a psychiatric or a substance abuse uh, situation. Keeps folks from getting hurt, gets people into recovery and treatment, and is often the first contact in giving people a hand up, not a hand out, but a hand up into recovery, into, you know, uh, coming through the correctional system, you know, a better and a person with, with, with goals. And I have to tell you that the amount of healthcare and behavioral health care that we have at our local jail uh, is a, a another testimony to the leadership. It, you know, it used to be that uh, when you went to jail, you, you languished without any care at all. And now we've, we've made sure that that care is available to people that need it. And not only that, try to do some planning as they come out uh, back into society, some a, a safety net to kind of, if you let me use the word catch people, in a positive way, you know, catch them when they come out of jail, help find a place to live, a job, medication. Family reunification is a big one. Uh, creating new social networks so they don't, there's less of a chance they'll go back to the old ways that tended to uh, get them in trouble. But crisis intervention training and the way our police and deputies are trained here in Shawnee County really sets the stage for everything that comes after that. Um, once we can have some positive contacts with people who are in trouble with the law. If they have a behavioral health problem, we can divert many of them from jail um, and, and safely uh, do that. And so it just gives officers on the street another level of discretion. Hey, look here, I could probably take this guy to jail. And, 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 and they do. I'm not trying to, I mean, we have tough law enforcement here and that's the way it ought to be. But they do have an extra tool and saying, you know, I think I got a situation here. I'm going to, you know, use my discretion, take the person to treatment, to an evaluation, maybe get them into the hospital. And we're trying harder and harder, especially since our county commissioners literally stepped up and passed a resolution called Stepping Up. Uh, it's, a na- it's a national model that they, they uh, modeled that after and became a Stepping Up uh, County where our efforts are very much focused on keeping people out of jail who can safely be kept out of jail, particularly those with behavioral health problems. And then once they're there, are they getting the care? And when they're ready to release into society, is society ready? Do we have a treatment plan? Do we have an intervention plan? Do we have some follow-up? And that's really what stepping up is all about. A lot of that is measuring where we're at. So I know that uh, Director Cole uh, has some information and can give you kind of some ballpark uh, figures and, and maybe even more specifically on, you know, the number of people in the jail that have a mental illness and kind of what we're looking at. But it's all about improving our, our data game so that we know who's there, what they need, where they're going, and we can help them get some direction in their lives. Uh, Director? Uh, well said, Bill. That You know, uh... And when dealing with the, uh, you know, the, even the crisis intervention does come into the jail, we've held crisis intervention uh, days for corrections as well, because it is a different system on the inside than it is the outside, going through some family impact panels and stuff like that. So we understand, you know, the impact of the family experience of when they have somebody who's in jail that has, suffers with mental illness. And we, we have to get better on our side because we're not mental health experts. Um, so we're doing that. But Bill is actually right. When you start the uh, the stepping up initiative, one of the things that we have to do not only, you know, is look at stuff is being able to de- determine and get a foundation of where we're at in the jail. 
I think nationwide, it's about 16, 70% nationwide of your population suffers with uh, serious and persistent mental illness. Those are your schizophrenia, your major depression and things like that. Um, I think that if you were to talk to somebody from NAMI, that if you start putting in stuff about uh, depression and some low level anxiety, you're going to start pushing up in the 60, 70, 80% mm -hmm. in your jails. Um, right now for the Department of Corrections, we run about 30% um, of SMI, which is the serious and persistently mentally ill. Uh, we work closely on having a, a, uh, a coordinated definition of that, of a, of a condition or a, a, a uh, that would that interferes with your, your work and things like that. Uh, we model Johnson County's definition. We thought that would best work for us. And then we started looking at all those who are on medications, uh, started looking at their behaviors, the length of stay, the recidivism rates, uh, race, um, gender, age. And so we have a good baseline, even the la average length of stay. Um, of those who are serious and persistent mean, mentally ill. So we can start getting a baseline and then start finding out the gaps we have to be able to do that. Uh, um, I think the average length of stay last year was for somebody who was uh, SMI was close to almost 300 days. A lot of that had to do with the pandemic. And there's, there's no doubt about that court shut down. Um, there were, there were, uh, 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 clusters both in our jail, State Department of Corrections, Larnard. So that hindered a lot of movement. Uh, Bill said is cor it, it is correct. Inmates do uh, languish, or they do, I believe, deteriorate in jail. And I, you know, and as proud as I am of our system of being a an accredited facility with the healthcare and behavioral healthcare, um, an inmate that waits a year to go to Larnard deteriorates because they have the right to refuse medication. I don't. I don't provide forced medications for competencies and but for behaviors we do um, but we try to stay away from that i want the dignity of the inmate to still remain that they're in control of their medications but um we we you know we have problems with that um and when inmates get here uh they sometimes they're fine with the structure and they don't they they they, they don't want to take their medication then they start to deteriorate sometimes they go to larder they come back we keep them on their medications. What often happens, they feel that they're doing okay and then they wanna discontinue their medications. We educate, we tell them, no, we don't want this to happen. Ultimately, we lose that battle. They have the right to refuse and then we start that system back over. Um, you know, what has been tr uh, truly beneficial is working with Vallejo who has a liaison that comes into jail weekly that gets a, a looks at our book in roster to try to find out who are some of the, some of the, uh, players or who are the same clients and patients so we can start working on the continuity of care uh, because you know I could say five six years ago we can get an inmate out but it may have taken them two months to get a doctor's appointment nothing wrong with Vallejo services is that we didn't have that connectivity and that's now we do we can try to get a, a, a seamless progression of, of care appointments medication family involvement and stuff like that but uh, the jail is a uh, uh, it is very, you know, we have today 550 inmates. So you're taking 30, 40% of those with serious and persistent mental illness. Um, it's expensive with medication. It's expensive with officer watch. Sometimes it takes two officers. Uh, you're talking about specialized care when it comes to those who have substance abuse, alcohol abuse. Then you throw on the medical part of it. A lot of the inmates that come in with mental illness are very sick, um, some with COVID. We've never sent anybody knock on wood to the hospital for COVID, but we're talking about heart problems. We're talking about liver problems, kidney problems. You name it, it's out there. Cancer uh, stuff. So the the ability uh, of, uh, of for us to, to, to be able to get them the services in here, uh, it's vital. And I would say five years ago, we had three people. Today, we have probably close to eight to 10 that are wow. dealing with behavior health. Um, we're the, it's not at the program level I want. I want a program, not just crisis services and just putting Band-Aids and pills in people or on people. I want a, a program of, you know, if I had it my way, my brother's an occupational therapist. I'd have OTs. I'd have recreation therapists. I'd have group sessions more. So we're looking at a lot of different things here, but staffing causes that. Uh, but uh, um, uh, 
yeah, we're going to, uh, we've got a long ways to go still and stepping up is going to, with the, uh, the help of uh, Vallejo and the, uh, uh, our government and our political leaders of, of signing the, uh, resolution and commitment to do that, uh, it's going to help us go a long ways. Part of the larger picture going on nationwide is, uh, in, in the area of criminal justice reform. And I know that most or all of you are aware of that and and Shawnee County's uh, right up there, maybe even a little bit ahead of the curve uh, in terms of, you know, uh, making sure that uh, the proper services uh, are in place. And and uh, so we, we keep trying to move forward with national trends. In fact, you know, one of the problems that was identified, you know, uh, probably within the last year or so is this this whole area of competency to stand trial. Uh, don't confuse that with the mental illness or the <clears throat> or the insanity plea. Not the same thing. Uh, competency to stand trial is um, basically answers the question: Is this individual uh, competent uh, to stand trial? In that, do they understand the charges against them? Do they understand the role of their attorney? Do they know what a judge does? Do they know what a jury does? You know, do they understand that that kind of thing? And sometimes, uh, because of one kind of cognitive impairment or another, individuals are not able to understand that information. And so, uh, the jail here has done a good job of getting those folks evaluated. And now we've put together a work team, and in, in, including uh, our some of our elected officials. Can we conduct what's called? restoration to competency can we through a series of programming probably fairly brief programming uh, restore folks's cognitive function to a place where they do understand the charges against them you know and that may involve med medication um, but you know do they understand the role of their attorney do they understand their basic rights and so we're working on being able to do that here in shawnee county which would be very unique statewide by the way, versus folks having to go to Larned State Hospital out in uh, out in central Kansas. Um, the hospitals, all, all the, the, the two or three state hospitals that we have have all um, reduced their bed capacity because of the COVID, making it even more difficult. And so, you know, we do have a number of folks in the jail waiting on restoration services. We hope to be able to put that programming together uh, in, the, in the near term, get that work done here reduce jail time, save money, increase dignity, let the justice system uh, do its work uh, with those individuals and as full participants. And that's just one uh, project that we're, we're working on. You know, we might uh, just step back a minute and um, take questions. I know several have been uh, posed uh, online, one in particular about forcing medication, you know, that's pretty difficult to do. Uh, there's a, a process to go through. And um, Brian, I don't know if, if we prepared to answer that question or not today, but uh, could I punt to you on that one? What was the question again, Bill? About forcing medication, psychiatric medication on people who are in jail. That's a tough area. Yeah, we don't force medication at all. We've already gone to the courts. We've already had that pushed back to us uh, um, that if we've uh, I have tried to get court orders to get people to force medication or to force people to the hospital when they weren't eating uh, or getting to the point to where they were delirious. The judge has ruled in the inmates favor 100 percent of the time. Um, the only time that we force medication is if the person is so abusive to themselves or others we will get a doctor to will sign off on there and I go to the judge and the judge will sign off on it. We can, the, and the doctor can. We have, uh, you know, I thought we had a psychiatrist on duty. Uh, duty uh, uh, I'm reading in here that uh, it's it indicated that somebody said we didn't. Uh, I, w I wasn't aware of that. I do know we have a regional psychiatrist who does, and uh, every, every medication an inmate's on is approved and prescribed by a doctor, um, but they will not, they will not force medication. Um, it's very rarely used. They don't force medication for competency um, at all. Um, we have, I think in my, let's see, 13 years as a director, I probably can count maybe twice that forced medication. And that was when a person was so uh, out of it 
um, and had been up for like three days. They felt the person was going to have a heart attack. Um, the potassium levels were so high. So the um, we got a court order through our um, through the judge to be able to uh, to give the. It's like maybe Brian froze up on us. I was typing in the chat. The shot. Box. My understanding is we don't always have to go through a hand out uh, force medication. They, 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 um, uh, they're not larger. Uh, Osoatomy. I'm from Osoatomy. So Osoatomy is where we send misdemeanors to uh, their larger are for felons. Um, Osoatomy cannot take uh, um, felons. So uh, there was a comment that is Shawnee. Osoatomy is Shawnee County Mental Hospital, not larger. That's not true. only for certain types of crimes. I might uh, take a minute here to recognize the role of, of peers, uh, people whom we refer to as having had lived experience, quote, in quote, lived experience. In our field, we call them the peers and uh, we employ about a dozen or so at Vallejo full and part-time. We, we call them peer support specialists Sometimes you hear the phrase peer support worker. These are individuals with lived experience in as having some form of uh, mental illness and in a pretty good stage in their recovery to a point where we can deploy them to help others who are trying to recover from uh, mental illness. And um, uh, so, you know, we've been able to make peer support available uh, in, in the jail. Uh, and then follow up uh, afterwards. Uh, so uh, that's just been a, a, a real important element to add people who've actually, you know, been down that path and are recovered or recovering to, to help, help their peers along, uh, which also, you know, uh, reminds me of the important role of families, you know, people whose loved ones have been involved in the juvenile justice system, uh, like it, like in my family and how important that is in uh, rehabilitation, uh, recovery, uh, and, and public safety. Uh, the roles of, of the families can't, can't be understated. And so when Vallejo and, and Director Cole and others formed the Intersection Coalition uh, last year, Dennis is a member, and I think a couple others of you, uh, intersection referring to that big intersection between behavioral health care, and the whole of the legal system, corrections, courts, probation, law enforcement. There's so many topics in common and there's so much reform going on in the state of Kansas and nationally that we thought we ought to get a group together to make sure Shawnee County was keeping up. In fact, as we look at ourselves, we're keeping up and then some. So, you know, the and we've, we've uh, had a very intentional effort to have people on the intersection coalition uh, who are who have lived experience and their family members so that their advocacy voice uh, can be heard. And I'm gonna open the chat here for a minute. Um, I see I the a, most yeah, recent I, question was, what qualifications do CIT staff? Was a question for you. Yeah, though. I can answer that. And then I also know that Vicki posted a question about Vallejo being unable to take somebody. That does happen sometimes, um, not very often, but it does happen sometimes. I can um, probably address that. Uh, but uh, the qualifications for staff at Vallejo that we call a co-responder is a, and the folks who work on the street with the police and, and the sheriff deputies uh, either have a bachelor's degree in social work, preferably a master's degree in social work, or uh, a degree with a license like a master's level uh, psychologist. And uh, that's the level of individual we, we try to employ. So, and then there are a few occasions <clears throat> in our detox program where people have medical issues that they need to be in a hospital to start their detox. We do have a couple of referral sources there when somebody needs a deeper level of, when they need what's called medical detox. Uh, although I, we're moving in that direction. Um, and then once in a while, when people show up at our 72-hour our crisis center, 
with some pretty severe medical problems. We had to refer them on to a hospital for or the ER for clearance and or uh, treatment. And then um, there are some individuals who, once they become dangerous to themselves or likely to be dangerous to themselves or others uh, because of a mental illness, uh, we have to have a court petition. We can have them placed at the state hospital. And so we may evaluate somebody for an hour or two or three and if it looks like they need to be involuntary, involuntarily placed at a state hospital, usually at Osawatomie, uh, you know, there's a process we go through. And so we would not accept them into our 72 hour program just because we don't have, I mean, we have treatment there, but it's not the, the level of, um, I hate to use the word confined, but, or forced, but it's a voluntary treatment center and people can, people can walk out. Um, and so, uh, sometimes people need a deeper level of care. Now, I don't know if that answers the question or not, but, um, and then what could CITs have, uh, you know, that's a good question, Sharon, about could our co-responders in the future have as a minimum license, what's called an LSCSW, which is licensed specialist in clinical social work. It's a person with a master's degree in social work with two or more years of clinically supervised experience who meet other criteria. And um, yeah, those folks are hard to find. We employ a number of them, but they're pretty difficult to find. So, uh, you know, we wouldn't want to set that as a minimum standard when the state of Kansas recognizes the minimum standard as an LMSW, a licensed master of social work. So first you get your master's in social work, you get your first license, you do your practice requirements, then you can apply for your clinical, your clinical license, uh, so to speak. And uh, setting the LSCSW as a minimum for hiring would be a tough road to hoe. Don't know where that leaves us with uh, other questions. I haven't been able to look at all the chats here. The only other, one, the first question we had, oh, here comes another one, but the first question was, does the jail have a, a psychiatrist on staff or plans to have one? Oh, you're on mute, Brian. In my career, I got hired in 89. What we used to have at the jail back in the day was we used to have one psychiatrist that would come in uh, to do competency evaluations for the court. And that we had somebody from uh, that person would also see um, and that person would come in once a week for about four hours and do competency and then evaluate inmates specific, specifically just for medication. We realized that was a failed system. And so what they used, so when we started contracting healthcare services, and that was all the way up to 2000, um, that's the way that was, um, um, we entered into agreement with a contracted service and we had a psychiatrist that would come in for four hours a day, or for, excuse me, four hours a week. They would come in to see four hours for the adults and four hours for the uh, um, juveniles. This was a full-time psychiatrist that was out at uh, uh, the VA and that we would, um, any type there would be orders of treatment, they would always go through this doctor, sometimes telemedicine or over the phone or computer, they would come in and then we had um, uh, advanced nurse practitioners that would come in for like four hours a week and do the same. And I didn't feel that was enough. Um, I always thought we still had a psychiatrist, but we just changed our contract. We cannot, it's tough for us to get a, psych, uh, a psychiatrist to come in. So we do now have a psychiatric ARMP, advanced nurse practitioner, who is here 40 hours a week, who sees our inmates for suicide ideation and things like that, for medications and also for treatment plans that we have. So that person is there. We have social workers, we have mental health technicians that are here, um, and, uh, and we have, uh, uh, at our regional level, we have psychiatrists and um, doctors that are on there that if there's something that needs to go beyond something on site, they will reach out to that group as well. Um, but we do not have a psychiatrist is on duty um, all the time. We do have an ARMP, a psychiatric ARMP. I might comment too about human resources in general. It's, it's tough to find help uh, 
you know, uh, and particularly, you know, people who work in the 12, 15, $16 an hour range. Um, and that's just, you know, that 25 to $40,000 a year salary plus benefits is a tough area to hire in, in the area of social services and healthcare and that kind of thing. And I will specifically comment on psychiatry, which is a branch of medicine, as you know. Uh, Vallejo is the fourth largest community mental health center in the state of Kansas. Uh, we employ about 325 people and operate on a total of about a $25 million budget. We have a psychiatrist um, on staff and on board uh, about two and a half days a week. Uh, so right at about a half a doctor. Um, years ago, we had three or four. But what has happened in addition to MDs being hard to find um, is that the whole practice of uh, nurse practitioners has developed in the last 10 or 15 years. So uh, at Vallejo, we employ 12 or 13 APRNs. Uh, uh, I think full-time equivalence is about 11, 10 and a half or 11 full-time psychiatrically trained, most of them from Washburn um, who prescribe medicine. And then, um, we have two days, two and a half, two, two and a half days a week of psychiatric coverage. And so, you know, Brian's, the jail has staffed up its prescribing, uh, much like the field of behavioral health has out, out, outside the wall. And in fact, uh, much of healthcare. So, you know, your primary care doctor, you know, uh, the person who maybe administers uh, your anesthesia prior to a procedure, those folks are very likely to be APRNs. Uh, and so the much of the healthcare these days is being delivered by APRNs. I don't mean to minimize the role of doctors, but as, you know, our technologies improve and demands go up and including the demand for behavioral health care, which has skyrocketed the last eight, 10 years, uh, we need more practitioners. And so we don't hire all MDs anymore to do prescribing. In fact, very few. We don't hire all PhDs in psychology to provide psychotherapy. We mainly hire social workers and people with master's degrees in psychology who are licensed at the state level. And, and, and so uh, practice has shifted uh, from MDs and PhDs uh, to people with master's degrees in nursing, counseling, social work, psychology, marriage and family therapy, addictions treatment, you know, 25 years ago, the typical alcohol and drug counselor was a recovering guy. You know, somebody who'd been to AA, been, you know, an alcoholic for many years, recovers and, and decides to become a counselor. And it, it, it took about, you know, very little to get that done. And there were some great people doing that kind of work, but that field as well began to introduce state licenses for that. And so that's, that's kind of where we're at these days are most of the alcohol and drug counselors you find out there today have master's degrees or above and have a state license and have a regulated practice either in the nonprofit or the private uh, world. I'm taking Just over a about human Carol. resources. Oh, thank you, Bill. I think that perspective is really useful for us all to hear. I'm taking over for Carol. She had to step away. Oh, okay. There's a question in the chat. Could Brian speak to the staffing issues at the jail? And then I'll give you both the heads up that I would like to know for all of us, what can the league do to support the stepping up? What kind of community right. support and advocacy do you right. need? But first, Brian, can you speak to the staffing issues at the jail, please? Staffing issues in general or just or, or, or staffing issues in general, uh, we, we take no second seat to what you've seen across the state or what you've seen across the nation. Um, this might be kind of a, a, a different position, but, you know, I'm really concerned. You know, some people say, you know, this, don't worry about it, Brian, this is happening everywhere. And my attitude has been, I don't, I don't care if it's happening everywhere. I'm worried about it happening. In Shawnee yeah. Um, uh, but what I will tell you is, is that, uh, we have, uh, currently about 65 vacancies of just officer staff. We are almost all full when it comes to Corizon staff, our healthcare, or behavioral healthcare, except maybe for a couple PRNs for LPN or RN or something like that. So we're doing okay that way. But when it comes to the security side, yes, we are we are following we are falling back uh, um, on that. Uh, we hire people. We we you know we we have a competitive wage. We start out close to twenty dollars an hour. Um, 
which is very competitive when it comes to our partners, maybe outside of Shawnee or Johnson County or Sedgwick County, who's maybe two or three dollars more. But other than that, we're pretty competitive. Uh, but when we get staff here, um, uh, if you lose staff, you start losing services. Staff get ordered, they get burnt out, they decide, and they're losing time with their family. And when we're doing, um, you know, I read an article from the Wall Street Journal the other day that said the three top reasons why people are not hiring in these types of jobs. Number one is uh, the stress, the PTSD levels in, in corrections has gone up as high or higher than military. Um, that the average length of uh, life after retirement for corrections officers is 18 months, uh, which is you're, you're getting people that are saying, look, I'm not going to take the stress. Child care or the lack thereof mm -hmm. with pandemic and lack there of child care, mandatory overtime. And some people have quit and looked me straight in the face and said, I can get more on assistance than working at the jail without a fear of my job. So I'll, I'll, I'll not work. Um, this is a tough job. Uh, you know, um, we have, um, you know, we started out the year with 70 vacancies. We got down to about 50. Um, but, uh, you know, we're not there yet. Uh, you know, I can talk to my colleagues at the police department, the sheriff's office dispatch. They're in the same, the same boat. Um, uh, my concern is the safety and security of the staff, our inmates, um, the quality of care. Are, are we neglecting anything at this point? I don't believe so. Um, but I, what I will say is the staff are very tired. They're burnt out. Uh, they mm -hmm. would like to go home and see their family after eight hours. And uh, right now it's very tough. I mean, I've even put on my uniform and worked a post. Um, and some people are like, oh, good Lord, we got the director working a post. And, you know, I'll say, hey, look, this old dog can still do some stuff. But it's different than what it was in 1989. Um, and so um, that's what worries me about uh, corrections. And uh, we're about life and death and decisions at the jail. We're an essential function. Um, by statute, the counties have to have a lockup. Um, we are that. And um, so staffing has um, been very tough. But uh, I'll give full kudos to this staff. I'll put them up against any staff out there. They, they've worked their heroes. They've worked through a pandemic. Uh, some of them are working three and four 16-hour days a week. Um, some of them like the money, some of them are tired, um, but that has become a problem. Thank you so much for answering that question so clearly. Um, for both of you, and I don't care who goes first, what do you need or what would you like the league, the league members to do to support the Stepping Up program? My uh, hope, Bill. Thanks, Brian. And, uh, you know, my, my hope would be uh, I mean, the state of Kansas, through a branch of government that we call KDADS, uh, the Kansas Department for Aging and Disability Services, they used to be SRS, basically, kind of in the old days, although it's migrated several times over the decades. They have hired statewide a stepping up coordinator, somebody who is encouraging and helping and supporting uh, every county as they look at how they want to respond to criminal justice reform, particularly in the area of behavioral health. And I do think that through our stepping up efforts, what's going to happen is we're going to demonstrate even more savings to city and county government as the months and years go by. And hopefully we can use some of that savings or cost avoidance to fund programs at the jail, mental health center, other kind of other places that, uh, out in the community, law enforcement, courts and others. For example, we're working on mental health courts and other kinds of specialty courts. I've been appointed by um, uh, the, 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 the state court to serve on that uh, committee. And, but so what we're, what we're trying to do is, is create a, a, a base from which you know, we can make good, better, even better public policy decisions. And, and what, one of the things you guys can do is, is speak up at the city, county, and state and federal level if you have access to it and just promote the idea that people can recover that we can we can safely keep some people out some people we can't but we can safely keep some people out of jail and it's not a matter of keeping them out of jail then what are you going to do with them well we need programs in the community to to uh, serve those uh, serve those individuals but that would help us a great deal what i'd like to see for the county and maybe it's a combined city county state funded deal um, is 
that Shawnee County would have its own full-time stepping up coordinator, probably a person trained in criminal justice, social work, sociology, psych some field of, you know, human service or and or criminal justice to, um, <clears throat> you know, actually shoulder a lot of the work that Director Cole is doing now and some of his staff and some of my staff and, and you know, for my, my part in it as well. But would really like to have Shawnee County have a full-time stepping up coordinator who could write grants, develop programs, you know, supervise programs, keep us all honest. Uh, hey, Bill, what are you guys doing over there? How about if we do this? How about if we do that? You know, somebody whose job it is to make sure that, you know, our jail houses uh, uh, people and, and, uh, who, and, and don't house people that they don't, they don't need to. So that's, that's my goal. And I'm hoping, you know, that maybe with at least some, with it be some startup funds that are COVID related that we could use for that for a year or two, just to get that position going. I think a position like that with the city or the county, particularly if we can get the state to match a few dollars would pay for itself in a few years and then some. I can tell you one program that we operate on the street with the police called the co-responder program. We talked about a little bit. Our, our guesstimate, we have some numbers to back this up is that we're saving a, a, around $150,000 a year for the county in jails, jail time avoided. So we meet a, an individual on the street, maybe, they're, maybe they've done something they could be arrested for, uh, but if it's, if it's something that could respond to some immediate treatment, the policeman, the law enforcement, the social worker on the scene are getting that person an early intervention, working upstream, getting them a chance to rehabilitate before they go to jail. So. Uh, we've we've avoided, you know, many, many jail bookings and many days of jail. Uh, Director Cole will tell you it costs about three times as much to take care and serve and house a person with a mental illness or an addiction in the jail than it does a person who does not have those problems. And so if we can safely, and we can't always, that those people need to go to jail, but if we can safely divert somebody from being even booked at jail, you know, uh, just one individual, we're probably saving about $1,500. So they'll stay what, Brian, three or four or five days, maybe at a minimum and three or $400 a day. It, it adds up pretty, pretty quickly. And those are some rough, rough numbers. Don't, don't take that to the press. That's just conversation between us, but. Yeah. Um, and, and Bill's, Bill's absolutely right. The, uh, the average length to stay right now for, for an inmate, a general population inmates about 29 days. Um, last year, we saw the uh, average length of stay for somebody with uh, serious and persistent mental illness was about 200. So, um, you know, that money adds up quick. And for our facility, we we are probably one of the higher spending counties of our size uh, when it comes to health care expense um, and medications. We spend uh, uh, about on average about twenty five thousand dollars a month on medication up to as much as $30,000 a month on medication. Um, the National Commission on Correctional Healthcare will come into our facility and they accredit our facility. And we're one of few um, facilities that are accredited um, when it comes to behavioral health care and, and uh, uh, medical um, care. Um, but uh, it is very expensive when you start talking about uh, the, the, the health care staff, the, the officer staff that and the medicines. And, you know, we have a pharmacy here and then we do work with the pharmacy um, to try to get as, as medications as much as we can. We don't want to start breaking up medications. Um, uh, uh, it, we want to make sure that we have a continuity of care from the outside, but uh, um, we do. Medications are very expensive, uh, spe especially injectable medications uh, and things like that. So uh, it is very expensive and when you start looking at alternatives to jail, I, I've always said to the commissioners who are on board to everybody that we either have to, we have to have a system and I'm not saying not everybody with mental illness doesn't need to come to jail because they do, because we have some very dangerous people um, with mental illness that are in jail for some very serious crimes, but we can either have a system that tries to avoid it uh, and get them the help they need, or we try to have us, or we're going to end up having a system. It's either you pay somebody on the street or the outside to do it, or you'll end up paying correction staff uh, to do it. And I'd rather have people on the outside, the experts doing it. You know, there. Are, uh, I know you have a large and um, influential membership. Anything you do, folks, where you show up at a 
chamber of commerce meeting, uh, a city meeting, uh, a, a civic club, uh, a church group, anywhere people are gathered and the conversation rolls around to, you know, any kind of stuff that deals with public safety. Uh, you know, bring up some of these issue, issues. And if, if I'm in the room, ask, ask me a question. You know, give, us, give it a chance to highlight it. If Brian's in the room, ask him a really, really hard question. But, you know, you can speak up just informally. You know, you're standing there in your backyard chatting with your neighbor while you're raking leaves. And they say, look, you know, gosh, you know, my nephew down in Oklahoma is doing this, this, this and having problems. And, you know, you can say, well, look, you know, here's what I know about mental health. Here's what I know about public safety. And, and you know, just try to just try to advocate one on one or in the groups that you belong to and take advantage of the other forums where you find yourself working and volunteering and, and operating. And for sure, the league has a loud voice uh, anytime the legislative season begins to develop and that's happening now. And make yourself seen and heard. Doesn't take a whole lot, you know, a one-on-one -on -one meeting as you catch a legislator in the rotunda for five minutes saying, hey, this is important to me that we have a plan for, you know, to fill in the blank. I will tell you, um, if the, the number one public safety problem that I think we have in the county, and I don't mean to minimize family violence or gun violence or, you know, assaults and robberies and, and aggravated theft and all of that, but the number one driver, if you ask me, uh, is the methamphetamine problem that we have in Shawnee County. We need more money to address that problem and our authorities uh, need more tools to address that problem. And I think you'd find wide agreement by that. I can't speak, you know, for elected or appointed officials, but but I when I mention that, people are going, yeah, you're right. And it's not that I discovered that. It's, you know, it's but you know, I do take every opportunity I can to comment on it. And so, in fact, I think one of the big threats to the safety of our law enforcement officers at city and county level is methamphetamine abuse uh, and and other uh, drugs that have pretty serious uh, agitation uh, behavioral uh, components to it. So if you're wondering any time about those root causes, methamphetamine abuse and addictions in, in my book, of course, what causes that? That's a whole nother conversation. Uh, I got about an hour and a half of, of opinion on that for you, but <laughs> it's only opinion. So uh, just think about, you know, what is going on? Well, it's the drugs. So um, that yeah, is, no, oh, go, ahead, go ahead, Brian. No, go, go right ahead. I was just going to say that we're almost to the end of our time and there's lots of questions popping up in chat. So this may be something that the league continues to talk about or have you all back. Um, if either of you want to have final thoughts on um, lack of mental health beds in inpatient, whether Medicaid expansion would help, um, how much people in jail are affected by mental health or substance abuse needs, and then where we can learn more, whether you have a one pager to summarize, where we can take our interest and our questions to learn more. So I'll let you Medi each have final words. Medicaid, mine, I'll take advantage of that Medicaid expansion question. Thanks for posting that. Heck yeah, uh, Medicaid expansion would help. Uh, Vallejo does about $1.6 million to $2 million a year of charitable care, care we don't get reimbursed for. So thank you, county and city and state taxpayers for helping us with that. But Medicaid expansion would just for doing what we do now, because we serve so many uninsured and underinsured people, would bring at least another half a million, uh, maybe six or 800,000 a year into Vallejo just for doing what we do now. Wouldn't have to hire any more people, see any more people, do any more business, just to pay for the people that we're now seeing for free or darn near free, Medicaid would pay that bill and the feds would pay 90 or 92% of it. I forgot what it is, but yeah, heck yeah. Medicaid, you can advocate for that all day long. Yeah, when it comes to the Medicaid, there's some specific rules when it comes to the jail, so I don't yeah. know. I agree with Bill 100%. It would help in the community and, and his his group, and and, and I, I agree with that. As far as the percentage of the inmates in jail, you know, we have about serious and persistent mentally about three, about 30, 35 percent higher on the juvenile side, probably about 40. Um, we've seen a higher increase in female inmates. Uh, I would say, you know, when it says uh, need mental health or abuse services, oh gosh, uh, 
a great deal of them. Uh, yeah. You have to understand that uh, when somebody comes to jail, it's life changing. And uh, there's nothing nice about jail. I mean, I can people can see a nice, clean facility, a credit facility. I, I don't care what I can adjective I could put in there. There's nothing nice about jail. Um, and so a lot of people sometimes develop some mental health issues when they come here. The best answer to that, Grace, I could say is, is a, a great deal of those we have in jail do need to have mental health or substance abuse. Many of them are co-occurring disorders. They have both. Um, and stuff like that. So that's that's another challenge. And the drug abuse and the methamphetamine, it's it's ruining lives in our community, and it's it's just very tough. I want to thank everybody for attending today. I'm going to close out the meeting on behalf of Carol. Um, our next Tuesday topics will be on Tuesday, November 2nd at noon. That is also election day. Um, so we hope to see you then. Um, if you want to invite friends to the meeting, they can sign up for the link through the library's website um, and uh, I'll get them that link. And of course, all league members receive it in their email. Um, thank you all so much for attending today and reach out to the league with any questions. You guys are the best, thank you. Thank you, Bill and Brian. It was so good to hear from you. Thank you for the work you're doing in our community. Thanks for your support. Yes.